All right, well, good evening and uh, welcome to Copernic. My name is Drew Desker, but I think most of you know that anyway. Uh, it's great to, uh, to have you with us here this evening. Um, again, not everything we do up here is always about astronomy, and tonight's uh, program is, in fact, not about astronomy. Um, but it's an opportunity for us to actually learn uh, about the world and, and um, how it affects us. And, uh, and tonight's topic, in fact, does that. I um, want to welcome those watching on the, on the live stream as well. Um, again, uh, all of our programs on, that uh, we offer on, uh, up here at Copernic, are, we do offer on the live stream. In fact, if you go to our website, you can go to um, the classes and programs and events, go down to um, public programs, upcoming Friday night programs, and you can see what's coming up. So tonight is, again, the, our TikTok um, with Jonah Cummings. Uh, next week is actually a talk about concussive brain injury and the physics and physiology behind it. Uh, by a, a local physician. Um, then uh, the weekend after that is uh, we'll have a talk about the seasonal science of forecasting and how El Nino, what it means for us this uh, this coming winter. And then, of course, we always do uh, uh, Black Holes on Black Friday, which is always uh, a very popular uh, 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 talk and also something that we do. Um, uh, we, we learn something new, every, especially now that, that we, we've been able to sort of find ways to image black holes. Um, uh, we seem to have new material to show every, uh, every, every year, so this is definitely worth coming back for. Uh, again, for those that are new to us, um, if you go to our, web, uh, our YouTube channel, Co Copernic uh, Observatory, um, you can obviously watch us live, and uh, as you have questions, you can, you can ask them on the chat. But also, uh, with that, you know, if you miss a program, uh, you can actually go back and watch it. So last week, we actually had uh, an imaging scientist on the uh, OSIRIS-REx uh, uh, program. Uh, his presentation was called To Bennu and Back. This was the spacecraft that went to the asteroid Bennu, uh, orbited it for a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of months, uh, actually a better part of two years, then had a, a, a sampling device go down, bump into the uh, asteroid, pick up material, returned to the main spacecraft, and it actually returned uh, just a little over a month ago. And uh, so anyway, if you go to our website, you can go, uh, go to our YouTube channel, I'm sorry, you can go and uh, check out some of these, uh, these previous, uh, previous talks. But let's, uh, let's go to tonight's program. Um, we're fortunate to uh, uh, have um, Jonah Cummings, who's with the uh, Central New York Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Alliance. Um, and um, uh, actually, one of our educators uh, ran into him um, a few uh, months ago and uh, thought, geez, this would be a great opportunity to uh, uh, reach out and talk about ticks in this case. So uh, uh, Jonah, I think if you're with us here, let me um, get this switched over here on Zoom. And Jonah, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can as well. I'm going to bring your picture up there so uh, we can see you here. All right. Well, um, without further ado, uh, Jonah Cummings. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Drew, for the introduction. And hello, YouTube and whoever's sitting there uh, watching this. I'm glad you could sit down and, and talk with me a bit with uh, and talking about ticks and Lyme disease. Um, we'll talk a little bit why about why I'm so passionate about this, this project. But um, the CNY Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Alliance, we pride ourselves on uh, spreading education and awareness about ticks and their associated diseases, and it is a massive issue here in upstate New York, and um, I'm hoping you can walk away with some info on how to keep yourself safe, especially during the, the uh, heavy season for ticks. So let's get right into it. So, like Drew uh, pointed out, my name is Jonah, Jonah Cummings. Um, you know, you you may have, if, if you watch news, I guess, a few years ago, you may have uh, ran into my dad. That's mostly how people know me. Uh, Dan Cummings, he was on News Channel 9, um, and he's kind of who got me hooked up here with the Alliance. But um, I am uh, a new educator for, for the CNY Lyme Alliance. I go to, you know, all different counties and, and give presentations and set up tables and, and try and spread the word about Lyme disease. Uh, I, I love the outdoors. I love to golf. Um, I love going for hikes and 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 uh, being outdoors. 
And uh, why, you know, I was saying I'm so passionate about this project, and it's because I, I was affected by Lyme disease six years ago when I was going into my freshman year of college. And, you know, six years later, I am still uh, dealing with the consequences. I'm still treating. I am still uh, going from doctor to doctor. And we'll jump into my story a little bit at the end. Uh, but I'm so uh, passionate about spreading this message because I know the damage it can do. I know how isolating this disease can be. Uh, so we're going to help you ha get some tips to stay safe this season and uh, make sure those ticks aren't, aren't making you sick. So this is what we're going to be covering today. First, we'll go uh, into some tick basics. Then we'll move into prevention, both personal and in, in the household. Then we'll go to the proper way to remove a tick. There is a, a, a proper and correct way to do it. Then jump into some signs and symptoms of, of tick-borne disease, and both early and chronic. And like I said in the last slide, we will jump into my story towards the end, and I'll touch on that briefly. And then I'll leave some time for Q&A at the end if there's anything I missed or anything you guys didn't know about. So first off, what is a tick? Uh, when I first started at, at the Alliance, I thought a tick was an insect, and I was quickly corrected by somebody on our board uh, who actually told me they're a small parasite, and they're a member of the arachnid family. And when you zoom in on these tiny little uh, parasites, you can see they have eight legs, so they're closely related to mites, spiders, scorpions. Um, they are not technically insects. Um, and one of the cool things about them is they have this thing called Haller's organ on their front legs. And that's what makes them so adept at uh, finding a warm-blooded host, because they have a very super sensitive, uh, a, a tick sense, we call it, I guess, on those front legs that allows them to sense CO2, odor, heat, humidity, and know when that warm-blooded host is coming. Um, and they're going to feed exclusively and only on blood, and they have to feed on blood to move to their next life stage. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but... This is kind of the little fun facts and the basic introduction to a tick. And now you can see on the on the screen, this is a beautiful map uh, put together by our very own Sarah Bon and Tangiamani up at Upstate. Um, he was running the tick testing lab, the free tick testing lab up at Upstate, which was a massive resource for our county and our state. Um, unfortunately, funding got a little dicey, so uh, it, we're hoping to re it reopens in, on January 1st, which is what he had mentioned. But um, we'll see, and we're, we're going to keep the community updated on when that testing center reopens. Um, but this is a good map about the distribution of where humans encounter ticks in New York State. So you can see down in, in the uh, Long Island and Manhattan area, the Lone Star tick is very prominent. Um, and something uh, uh, not so fun fact about the Lone Star tick is one of the co-infections, along with uh, a Lyme disease that it can pass on, is going to be um, alpha-gal syndrome, which is a very odd thing. Um, and But the hallmark of alpha-gal syndrome is that uh, once somebody is infected with that, they develop a very harsh allergy to red meat out of nowhere. Um, so somebody could not know they were bitten by a tick, go out to Texas Roadhouse or wherever your favorite steakhouse is, get a steak, and all of a sudden become deathly ill with no reason why. Well, this is one of the reasons why alpha-gal syndrome. Um, and then you can see as you move up into the Catskills area, the orange starts to, to be more prominent, and that's going to be the dog or wood tick. Um, and then up near uh, near me over here in, in, uh, in central New York, the black-legged deer tick is going to be the most common that you'll see, Ixodes scapularis. But um, you can see that they're spread across the state, but they do have these predominant areas across the state, these, these three ticks. Now, these are, uh, we, you always get to a slide in, in your presentation that's the fun facts. I, I think ticks are interesting, but nothing about them screams fun. Uh, but the, these are the not so fun facts. And I think uh, a lot of people get blown away by these because ticks are not fragile creatures. Uh, they, they are tanks. They live two to three years. Uh, they go through four life stages, the, uh, the egg, the larva, the nymph, and the adult. Um, each one progressing with a blood meal. So the, the larva will feed on a small rodent, uh, most likely a, a mouse or something along those lines, get its blood meal, drop off, turn into the nymph, uh, progress and get its blood meal, and then progress into the adult stage. Um, adult females will lay anywhere from 1,500 to 10,000 eggs in their lifetime. They replicate like mad. 
Um, so uh, you can tell why this is a growing issue, especially with climate change and it becoming more hospitable to ticks. Um, the, the climate, there are this issue is growing every year, and we can see it in the numbers of cases of tick-borne illness. Um, fortunately, we are getting out of the nymph's most active season, and the nymph is the usually the most responsible for transmitting these these diseases um, because they're very hard to spot on the body. They're very small. Um, but even though we're getting into the fall and the winter months, uh, that doesn't mean we can let our guard down, especially what I was just talking about, climate change, milder winters. Um, because of those things, ticks active season is becoming a bit longer. And anytime you can see ground, ticks are around. Uh, I didn't mean to, to rhyme right there, that's, but it's, it's true. Um, the, the, anytime you see grass or leaf litter or uh, anywhere that's, you know, unless there's a huge sheet of ice on top of the, of, on top of the ground, the ticks will be around and you do have to pay attention. So our other educator, Elizabeth Balfour, she she coined the term tick taxi, and I've, I've stolen it ever since. I love that uh, phrase for, for the hosts uh, for ticks. But I think when most people think of Lyme disease, they think of the white-tailed deer. I think if you asked anybody on the street, well, what do you think of when you think Lyme disease? They they will pull up a, a white-tailed deer in their mind, uh, which is which is accurate. The, the uh, adult black-legged deer tick, appropriately named, is the primary host uh, it is the primary host for that tick, but, uh, you know, rodents and birds, I think, and uh, people don't give them enough credit for being uh, great and popular hosts for ticks. These things you see in your yard, you know, um, uh, mice, squirrels, chipmunks, any type of rodent, and then birds who are ground feeders. A lot of these birds up here in the Northeast are, are ground feeders, and you can see them if you do have a bird feeder outside at your house, uh, picking at the seeds on the ground or out on your yard. Um, they can pick up ticks, um, and it's extremely interesting to me because um, I, I'm surprised at the amount of attention um, or lack thereof that they're getting because birds uh, could be responsible for a massive amount of the spread of tick-borne illness because they go to feed on the ground here in the Northeast, pick up an infected tick, fly 100 miles, drop it in a new place, and all of a sudden there's an incidence of Lyme disease that never existed, right? So I've always thought that is very interesting, but these are going to be your most common tick taxis here. And I actually just had a, a presentation with the Onondaga um, Audubon Society, and they're all about birding and conservation. But they were telling me uh, about all the different species of birds around here that carry ticks and the ground feeders. Um, and a study in 2021 uh, suggested that thrushes might be the the, the riskiest species, I guess you could say, uh, of transmitting Lyme disease. Um, but what I didn't know is that the red-breasted robin, I believe, is also a thrush, and they kind of educated me on that at, at my presentation, which was great. Um, but that that's birds are, are a huge point of interest for me and for the uh, scientists studying this the spread of Lyme disease and how to curb it. So let's do a little tick myth busting. Um, I know I, I can't see anybody or who's listening to me, but the show Mythbusters was like my my stuff back in the day. I used to love that, especially when I was homesick from school. It was like the only thing on, completely irrelevant to ticks. You can erase that from your mind, uh, but I loved that show. Um, but let's do some tick myth busting. And I'm going to be referring mostly to the deer tick because that's mostly what we're going to uh, come across. Um, they do not climb up trees and fall from trees. They don't fly, ticks do not have wings. They don't jump, they don't run, scuttle and chase after you. Um, and most importantly here, they do not die in the winter months. Um, like I was mentioning, uh, climate change is obviously playing a role in that, um, but ticks, they live two to three years. And I think a lot of people think when winter comes around, when it gets cold and the freeze comes and there's ice on the ground, the ticks die. Um, that is not true. They, there are these little microclimates and things they can find underneath the sheet of ice and the leaf litter, or they find a warm-blooded host to attach to and start their feeding. Um, they, they do not die. They don't go away in the winter. So if you're out on a, on a nice hike on that one or two 60-degree day we, we have in the winter up here, um, still be on the lookout for ticks. They're still out there. And Drew, if there are any questions, interrupt me, pause, stop, do it in the chat. Um, I will, I can stop at any point. Here we go. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do it. We'll just, uh, All right. typically put them at the end, but, um, if something pops up, we'll, we'll let you know. Thanks. Yeah. Sounds good.
Now, this little video you'll see here on the screen is, is what ticks do, and it's called questing. So ticks, um, when they're on the hunt for their host, they do a thing called questing, and they hold on to a branch with their third and fourth pair of legs. They work like Velcro, and they're going to reach out those very sensitive front arms, and I actually have a little stuffed animal here. I'm not sure if you can see it. It's very cute, um, and it, it, they reach out these front legs and looking for a host to, to brush by and attach to them. These front legs, like I said, work like Velcro, just like the back. And uh, once they're on you, they don't want to get off you. <laughs> once they start, once they find a place to bite and start feeding, uh, they want to stick on you. And what's interesting about ticks is that the number one, their mouthpiece is has ridges and and it uh, little yeah little ridges in them that allow it to kind of really sink into the skin. And they also insert this cement like substance into your. Uh, body, which kind of allows them to stick in the skin. I'm sorry for anybody that's sensitive about uh, that type of stuff, but once they're they're in you, that's why if you've ever removed a tick, they are they can be a little bit tough to get out because they have that cement, they have the ribbed mouth parts, um, and they're really they're really good at finding a place that you don't look all that often. So we'll we'll try and do that. But this is what they do uh, when they're trying to find a host. It is called questing. So uh, I know not everybody's home fits to this little grid up here. And, you know, I live in an apartment in downtown Syracuse in a, in a concrete jungle down here, far away from ticks, um, which is fine by me after what, what I've gone through with them. But uh, this, you know, my parents' home looks a lot like this in the backyard. And this is just a good rubric of kind of what you can do uh, to mitigate some of the risk when it comes to ticks in, in your or near your household, especially if your house backs up to forest or uh, the lining of vegetation, brush, um, you're gonna want to, if you can, uh, the, the experts say, put a wood chip or stone barrier in between the edge of the forest and your lawn. Um, because I, I might touch on this a couple of more times as well, uh, ticks do not like dry. Ticks uh, thrive in moisture, and that's why the Northeast forests here uh, in New York are such a great uh, spot for them because they're um, very moist, very shady. Uh, ticks don't like dry uh, grass. They don't like very shortcut grass out in the beaming sun. They want to be right on the edge of the forest where they'll get some shade, some moisture in the leaf litter by tall grass. So if you create this barrier, it's going to stop uh, a lot of ticks from crossing from the line into your yard. Um, and then if you can kind of make another little tick migration zone of take your primary hot spots in your lawn of your kids swing set, your garden, your fire pit, whatever you got, um, and move it even further away from that lining of the woods. Because again, ticks are very small, and they're not going to move that far in their lifetime. And so you want to be as far away from the hot spot, which is the edge of that forest vegetation brush as possible. Um, and I don't like this number five. Uh, point here it says tick safe zone really anywhere that a, a ground feeding bird goes uh, a rodent uh, a mouse a squirrel anything like that uh, a tick can and will be there so i don't think there's such thing as a tick safe zone but it it is a tick safer zone if you do put these steps into into play um and then you know you can go to the uh, very extensive uh you know lines when it comes to deer resistant crops and spraying different things on your uh, brush and vegetation. Um, I'm not an expert when it comes to pest management and the sprays, um, but we do have some experts on our board that, that would be happy to answer some of those questions. Um, so yeah, this is, this is uh, how you can protect yourself at your home. And then when you're out, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, like I said, I love to go out and play golf. I love to go out for hikes. And once you've been afflicted with Lyme disease or a tick-borne illness, and especially after all the stories I've heard of people who suffer, um, it becomes a little bit scary. You get you become a bit of a nut when you're outside. You, you don't want to go near any uh, brush or you don't want to go near any high grass, And um, which is it's, it's good to stay in practice and keep that practice going. But there are some things you can do with these things on the screen to uh, mitigate your risk. And one of those things, I, in, in my opinion, the most effective way is to treat your clothing with permethrin. Uh, so what, what I do, for example, with my golf pants, uh, I'll go to my parents before the, the golf season. I'll hang them out over my parents' uh, clothing line, and I'll soak them down with permethrin. So once that permethrin dries, 
uh, the chemical becomes both an, a repellent and a, a killer of the tick. So they'll crawl on the clothing that you've treated and they'll get a dose of bapromethrin and they'll die. The one note that I have written here on screen is that when it is wet, permethrin can be lethal to cats. So you do have to be aware of that. Don't spray it in your house. Um, don't, don't spray it around, especially if you have pets. And I know some people are very uh, careful about the chemicals they use. Once this chemical dries, it is the most effective way to keep the ticks off of you. However, I also get very hot when it comes to the summer. I love to golf. Um, like I said, I've repeated that five times, but uh, I like to wear shorts when I'm out playing golf. And I'm not always going to wear pants if it's a 98 degree day. I don't want to go out there looking like a Scottish golfer from the 40s with the, the tall socks and the, and the uh, pants tucked into the socks. So a, a skin safe chemical you can use, and it's worked wonders for me, I did not have a tick bite all year, um, was to put on Picaridin. And that's uh, my favorite brand is Ranger Ready. We're not sponsored by that brand or anything, but that's the brand I use. Um, and just a, a, a tip for maintenance and killing ticks, when you come back inside from taking a hike or a picnic or golfing or going for a walk, um, you can take your clothing and put them into the dryer on high heat for at least six to 10 minutes, 15 to 20 would be better. Um, and that amount of time in the dryer will kill the ticks because again, what, what was I saying about ticks? If a tick dries, they die. They don't like dry. Now, uh, I, again, I, I think permethrin is the most uh, important and effective way to prevent tick, uh, tick bites um, outside repellent wise. But I would, I would say this slide is the most important. If you take nothing away from this presentation on, on this Friday evening, uh, take this away. Anytime you're doing an outdoor activity, whether you think you were exposed to a tick, whether you think uh, you, you stayed on the path when you were on a hike or you went in very short grass, whatever you're doing, when you go back inside, hop in the shower as soon as you can. And before you hop in, take a couple of minutes and do a tick check. This should become as routine as, as brushing your teeth, as doing anything before bed, flossing, making your bed, this should become habit, especially in the peak months um, of tick season. And so ticks, again, are very smart about where they bite you. They know where to go. They love spots where skin touches skin um, and hard to, hard to find spots on the host. So the hairline, behind the ears, uh, under the arms, the belly button, the groin, uh, the legs, behind the legs, between the toes, and they're very, they're incredibly small. So you have to admit, take a very close look, make sure that no ticks crawled on you. And even taking that shower after briefly after coming inside um, will prevent a, a tick bite a lot of the time because they do take some time to find uh, a spot to bite. And um, I always, I always, I'm a little hesitant by saying this because I, I think it, it gives people a little buffer of time that they think they're safe. Um, but uh, it, it, according to research, it will take 24 to 36 hours of the tick being engorged and feeding on you to transmit Lyme disease um, because it takes time for the spirochete, which is the germ that causes Lyme disease, to get to the salivary gland of the tick to then go into you. Um, but there are other viruses, co-infections that I've uh, been learning about recently that can uh, be transmitted to, to a host in hours. So you, you want to be as careful as you can and, and look for these ticks um, as diligently as you can after any outdoor activity. Now, this is very important as well. There is a safe way to remove a tick. So God forbid you're, you're doing your tick check and all of a sudden on your, on your arm here, you see a tick. And uh, here we have my friend again. So if the tick goes and, and, and bites you, you'll see the hind end is kind of sticking up here. So what you're going to want to do is take a pair of fine tip tweezers, and I wish I had a pair right here with me, but I'll use my fingers, very highly uh, technical and educational. And you're going to want to slide in as close as you can to the skin where the mouth meets the skin and do a smooth, even pull upwards. You don't want to twist at it. You don't want to pull at it. You don't want to come in from the top. And uh, if you haven't already guessed it, uh, why you wouldn't want to come in on the body is because the harmful bacteria, the Lyme bacteria, the, inf uh, the infections uh, reside within the gut of the tick. So if you come in and you squeeze the body of the tick, uh, that they can regurgitate that into the bloodstream 
and uh, raising your risk of becoming ill with a tick-borne illness. So as close to the skin as possible, smooth even pull upwards, and then wipe it down with an antiseptic wipe. Uh, take a look at it. Uh, you can even take a Sharpie and draw a circle around the bite site. So you can keep an eye out for any rash that might occur after that. And then just keep an eye out for symptoms afterwards. Um, because I, you know, I always tell people who find a tick on them not to panic. It's one of the best things that can happen. Uh, it's people like me who never found a tick or saw a rash or a tick bite um, that end up becoming very ill because it, the diagnosis can be so easily missed. And we're, we're going to jump into that as well. So ticks are, are referred to as the dirty needle of nature. Um, they can transmit a, a lot of different pathogens, and it is rarely just Lyme disease. Lyme disease has kind of become this blanket term for all tick-borne illness, but there are dozens of co-infections and different things like Babesia, Bartonella, um, Rickettsia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, it, it often be becomes a, a viral and, and bacterial soup that a tick can feed into you. Um, but focusing on Lyme disease, uh, it, it is caused by, by like what I wrote here, one of the most complex bacteria ever discovered. Um, it's a spirochete, a spiral shaped similar to syphilis, the bacteria that causes syphilis uh, bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. And this was only discovered back in the 80s, um, in mid 70s to the 80s um, by a man named William Burgdorfer. And uh, this all came after a juvenile, a case of uh, a lot of cases of juvenile arthritis that broke out in Lyme, Connecticut. And that's kind of where this train started moving. Um, but that is Lyme disease. Now, this is kind of the hallmark symptom of Lyme disease. You know, I said, what kind of host would somebody think about when they think Lyme disease? They might think of a white tailed deer. When they think of a symptom, they might think of the bullseye rash. This is indicative of Lyme disease. If you do get this bullseye, it's it's pretty uh, uh, pretty dead nuts that you might have Lyme disease or that you do have Lyme disease. Um, it's called erythema migrans uh, rash, and it does sometimes appear like a bullseye. But as you can see in the diagram above, it doesn't always appear as a bullseye. Um, it can be a, a whole host of disseminated lesions. It can look like a bruise. It can look like a zit. It can look like uh, just a raised red patch. It could be itchy. It could hurt a little bit. Um, so it, it can present in many different ways. It's not just a bullseye. And I think it's important to note that many cases of Lyme disease, um, you know, and now research is saying that less than half, even to 30 to 40% uh, are going to be the ones that uh, present with a bullseye rash. So there could be as many as 60% of people that get contract Lyme disease and do not present with this rash. So don't use the rash as your only uh, indicator of Lyme disease, but definitely if you do get it, take a picture, show it to your doctor and get on an antibiotic as soon as you can. Now, ticks are called the dirty needle of nature, while Lyme disease is called the great imitator. And then because as you can see on this list of symptoms, uh, Lyme disease can mimic quite a few different illnesses. And if there's anybody who's above the age of, uh, you know, I guess I'm 24. And, and uh, so anyone above that age, um, <laughs> you wake up some days, most days with at least one of these, right? You got a headache, you're, you're fatigued, you have some muscle pain, you're so it, sometimes it is hard to, um, to catch Lyme disease early on, because it can present so vague and can lead to a, a whole host of misdiagnosis, misdiagnoses, which happened to me. Um, but what I always tell people is if you are in the months of the spring to summer months and you come down with a flu, nobody else around you is sick, you, you get fevers and a, a kind of a, a summer flu or a spring flu, uh, think Lyme first. Go to your provider, discuss Lyme disease, discuss getting tested, um, especially if you were in an exposure or in a place that possibly is, is a hot spot for ticks. Um, definitely discuss that with your provider if you have any of these symptoms. Uh, it's it's it can be vague, but if you catch it early, it is very treatable. Now, unfortunately, for people like me, and for uh, about one in five people who uh, do contract Lyme and, and other tick-borne illnesses, they tend to stay sick. Now, this is it's a big point of contention. It's been a big point of controversy. Um, the CDC, you know, actually recently just changed their language. Um, to uh, validate that this can become a chronic illness, that this the symptoms can become chronic. 
Um, but you know, that's if you know, there's about 500,000 cases of Lyme disease in the United States estimated every single year. And if one in five of those people are staying sick, that's a lot of people per year. You know, I'm no math genius, but that's a lot of people uh, with months to years of lingering symptoms after Lyme disease, which makes this such a uh, important thing to discuss and to keep researching and exploring. Um, but this is this is why I'm so passionate about uh, you know giving out this message because I'm one of these people. I've, I'm 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 one of the one in five. And, um, you know, even today I'm struggling quite a bit. And this is six years later with these odd lingering symptoms of inflammation, autoimmunity, those types of things. Um, it's not quite uh, cemented yet on, on why, what causes it or why certain people stay sick and others don't. But there's a lot of great minds researching this. Um, and hopefully there will be some more answers soon. And there is some, there is hope for people like this. There is treatments, and I do feel much better than I did three years ago through treatment and, and getting help. Um, but it is an unfortunate consequence of getting Lyme disease or tick-borne illness. And this is a, uh, it's a film. We are not associated with this film. There is no uh, association with the CNY Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Alliance, but it's a movie that I found very moving. And if you do have free time and an extra four bucks that you can spend on Amazon uh, Prime, uh, you can rent this movie, The Quiet Epidemic. It really uh, hits home for anybody who knows anybody suffering with Lyme disease or dealing with the chronic effects or the long-term effects. Um, and it details the history of kind of the controversy, the politics, the mystery behind this disease very well. And so if there is any volume on your end, Drew, I'd like to play this trailer. It's only a couple of minutes. As a kid, I was very eager. I was very active. I loved to dance. But those things about me started to change. Even though I knew something was wrong, I never imagined it would be this. Let's see meds. Those are all full. This is what life became. There are more cases than HIV and breast cancer combined. Right now, my hands are burning. You could do all the right things and get bit by a tech. And it'll change your world forever. I was having a lot of patients coming into my office with bullseye rashes, and about 80% would get better with antibiotics, but 20% would not. Here's a disease that's affecting a lot of people, can be costly. And there's been a very active effort to define not Lyme disease away, but chronic Lyme disease away. They saw nothing wrong in the laboratory test, and they figured she must be faking it. This is one of the most controversial, divisive debates in medicine to death. The Lyme disease bacteria is definitely one of the smartest on the planet. It knows how to change forms. Every doctor I've been to is saying, it's all yeah. in your head. You still have these doctors who are taking the pills in the center. You're going to image this. I'm not sure there's a controversy anymore. You have your answer. I'm going to go crazy. How many people go through this? Men just go home and suffer in silence. Yeah, we did we did hear that thanks okay perfect i was hoping you did um so yeah the, this uh, obviously this movie uh, if you do have the chance it, it touched me it's very powerful um and and once you kind of open this door to lyme disease and its history and how complex the bacteria is and ticks are and the the spread of ticks uh, once you open that door you, you don't come back it's it's very interesting it's uh you, you can get lost in that rabbit hole um but this is this is my story. You can see my positive uh, Western blot Lyme disease test up here from 2017. Um, I was a very healthy young man going into college. Um, it was I was never had really a health issue besides some broken bones playing sports and um, you know really nothing much. And then I woke up one day just out, out of the blue and and woke up on vacation with my family and um, had to get rushed to the hospital for heart issues and brain issues and. Um, I was having all these odd symptoms out of nowhere. Um, and then we got back home and within a month, my primary care physician 
uh, died, you know, had the wherewithal to test me for Lyme disease, which I was lucky. Um, a lot of people miss it for years before they're tested and diagnosed, but I was uh, within a month of being sick, I was treated with the standard dose of uh, three to four weeks of doxycycline, uh, antibiotic, the standard treatment. But unfortunately, I was one of the 20%, the one in five uh, people that, that do not get better after treatment. And so uh, my health continued to deteriorate. And so I went to college, I toughed it out, toughed it out. You know, I, I went to doctor after doctor who was saying, you know, you're just an anxious kid, you're, you're stressed out, you're, you know, there's you're, you have a clean bill of health, but at, you know, I was going back to school and just couldn't get my head off the pillow for half the week. And, uh, you know, lights would bother me. And I, you know, there would be different brain fog issues that my cognitive symptoms were off the charts. Um, so that, that kind of graduated to when COVID came around and we got sent back home. Um, I, I turned 21. And then by that time, I could hardly uh, get out of bed. I was bedridden for months at a time. I wouldn't eat. Um, you know, I went down to, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty tall, big guy and, and went down to 155, 160 pounds. Um, and I, I, at that point, I was like, Mom, Dad, you know, I think it's time we find a, a LLMD or a Lyme literate medical doctor. And I found a great one here in, uh, in Chittenango, New York. Uh, named Heidi Pook at Integrated Medicine of Central New York. I love to shout her out because she, um, along with other providers, has has effectively saved my life. Um, I'm I'm working full time now for the Alliance. I'm going traveling, talking to people. I'm back on my feet, doing some exercise, doing different things. Um, so and and like I said here on the slide, I'm back to about 65, 70 percent. You know, I don't feel anywhere close to what I did when I was a healthy uh, young man going into college. But um, compared to the 10 to 15% that I was three years ago, not being able to get out of bed or take a shower uh, without uh, breathing heavy and then passing out afterwards. I'm, I'm pretty happy to be here. Um, and I'm happy to be able to share my experience and, uh, and hopefully prevent any of these stories from happening to you or your son, daughter, niece, nephew. Uh, the more we know, the easier it is to prevent. So um, that is my story, the Spark Notes version. And if you do know anybody, um, which I'm sure I would be willing to bet at least one of you in the audience or on YouTube uh, knows somebody in your family that is struggling with Lyme disease or uh, was really hit hard with it, um, we do have a support group. It meets every second Wednesday of the month at the Community Library of DeWitt. Uh, it's right off the Jamesville exit, right by the First Tee Golf Course over there. Um, I've gone to as many as I can. It's very... Uh, very beneficial for me. It's it's patients come and shed tears, tell their stories. It's a nice safe space um, because this disease can be very isolating and difficult. And I'm coming off this week, and I'm sorry if I've seen has seemed uh, scattered or, or at all during this. This has been one of the tougher weeks I've had in in a couple of years. So, um, but that's it proves my point all the more that um, this is a very important issue. And for anybody that's struggling, please. Please uh, let us help you connect the dots. Let us help you find support. Um, so this is one way you can do that. And then these are my sources. And I do have some time for Q&A if there's any questions. I can't see anybody, but I have a massive <laughs> standing ovation yeah, yeah, in I just, front of you, Drew. Sure. I, um, all right. So um, anyway, I guess do we have any questions here in the um, – well, we do have one question here. I'll just take my mic over so that uh, you can hear it, as well as the ones on the live stream. How big is the largest tick, um, and what is it? Also, how small is the smallest tick, and what is it? I mean, so they, they are incredibly, incredibly small. That's a great question. So when I pulled out this big guy, don't think a tick is this big. Um, they're, they're very small. They can be, uh, you know, an adult can be the size of a, a grain of rice, while a, a larva can be the size of a, a, the top of a, the pin of a needle. Um, they're, they're very, very small. Um, and so that's why it, checking the body so diligently uh, can be very important. And I'm not sure that the second question, I, I, I heard the first, but the second how, one. I, how small is the smallest one? <laughs> very, very small. Let's stick with that. But it's, um, it's uh, I'm trying to think of something that is a um, good representation. If you take a pencil, a number two pencil, and, and take it to your hand uh, and, and just do a little twist, it'll leave a tiny little mark on your hand. 
that's about as small as they can get. And that is very small. And you, you'll see how small that is on the skin. Um, hard to spot. And that's why checking is so important. Good question. I have a question is, do all ticks carry Lyme? No, no. There are hundreds of, of species of ticks um, in, in the United States and or in the world. And, um, you know, many of them carry different diseases. So it's not uh, just Lyme disease, but it's such a prevalent thing in our area for the adult black-legged deer tick that they are notorious, obviously, for carrying Lyme disease. So um, those those are the ones to look out for. But they uh, all different ticks carry all different diseases. It's uh, it's it's quite the quite the thing. All right, got another question here. Well, not really a question, but a comment. <clears throat> sure. Uh, a few years ago, we had a guy from Binghamton University here talking about uh, ticks, and they do. Th uh, and you mentioned earlier about the have three blood feedings to go from stage to stage to stage. And from what he, he was saying is the first blood feeding, all ticks don't have Lyme disease. And, and, and when they, but if they, but if they feed upon a sp certain species of m mice that has it, then they have it. And then the second feeding, then they can pass that on or, or the second feeding, if they do a mouse, they can get it. So if you get a, a tick, it may not necessarily have Lyme disease. It all depends on if it, if it, you know, if it's previous feedings, if it came across a, a mouse that had the Lyme disease, from my understanding. Do you Great point. Great point. Um, um, ticks are not born. They don't come out of the egg stage into the larva with with Lyme disease. They are not. The Lyme disease is not passed from the adult tick to the larva. Um, you are correct that it, once they feed on an infected host, that is when they can then infect a human. Um, but it, the the smaller ticks uh, tend to feed on the smaller hosts. So when a human gets bitten by a tick, it's usually either a nymph or an adult stage tick, uh, which would be more likely to carry Lyme disease. They do not all carry Lyme disease, but um, the once they get to the adult stage, once they've had one or two feedings before that, the likelihood of them having a tick-borne illness does go up. But that's a great point, sir. Thank you. We do have a question from the chat from uh, Polar Teddy asks, um, do ticks stay active at night? And are you more likely to get, you know, are just as likely to get a, a, a tick uh, connection uh, at, at night versus uh, during the day? You know, that is, um, I've never been asked that before in my in my job here. I w need to figure that one out. Um, if, if you want to leave your email or something in the chat, I will look into that with our, uh, the scientists on our board, because I, I do need to know that I, I've never heard uh, if they are more active at night. That is a great question. But uh, I do not know the answer. So I don't want to pretend I do. So um, I don't know if their activity uh, increases, I would assume it does during the day, but I don't know that for sure. That is a great question. Wow. As, although I'm thinking, I think early on in your presentation, you talked about how uh, they have some certain sort of heat sensing sensors in its in their uh, front legs? If yes, they, yep, the howler's organ in, the, in their front legs, yep. So it makes me think then uh, if they're, if that's sort of, <laughs> for lack of a better, you know, heat seeking, uh, then whether they, you know, uh, need light to, to, to sort of find their host is, you know, probably less of, less of an important, but we do have another question here. Awesome. Do you think that, um, Tick-borne illnesses cause more deaths in, um, than mosquito-borne illnesses, or roughly equal, or the other way around. That is a great question too. Um, I, you know, the number of deaths, uh, the mortality rate when it comes to Lyme disease. I, I also don't know that figure. Um, it's not a, a usually a lethal uh, uh, disease. Off once once you get it, I know there are uh, lethal. Uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. So, um, you know, I, I don't know the the number of, of deaths when it comes to mosquitoes, but I know they're both pretty big issues. Um, and I, but I do know we do have some vaccines and treatments for mosquito-borne uh, bacteria and illnesses that we can get from them. But again, I, I'm more of the tick guy myself, and then uh, so I'm not sure if the numbers are comparable or comparable. But um, I don't, I, I'm not sure on that. 
All right, any other questions? Oh, we, get, we have another another one here. Hold on. Uh, in the early winter of last year, I had a blood test and it tested positive for antibodies for Lyme disease. Prior mm. to that, I had had, I thought I had malaria. It was so bad. Wow. Um, so should I do anything? I mean, nobody has said anything about it. No one has ever uh, said, oh, you have Lyme disease, although I've been treated twice for it with doc doxycycline. Got any suggestions? <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it, it's all an individual um, thing. You know, I cannot uh, and, and will not uh, push any medical advice. I, I'm not a trained physician, so I can't uh, push anything like that on tr about treatments. Um, but if you are still dealing with symptoms um, post a positive Lyme disease test, then you may require further treatment um, from a Lyme literate doctor. And we do have resources on our website for doctors who are trained, um, and this is kind of their specialty. So um, if you were still concerned that uh, you had symptoms that are not addressed and it might be lingering Lyme or untreated Lyme, um, then I would definitely explore that. But uh, you know, if you feel you were successfully treated with the doxycycline, which many people are, um, then you can just keep an eye out for anything else, but you're most likely fine. But if you're still suffering symptoms, yes, look into it. Uh, yes, uh, I think there's also a sort of an elephant in the room here, which is you, you discussed that it's controversial whether there is chronic Lyme disease or Lyme disease that requires chronic treatment and you can parse it out into several questions as to whether there is a post-Lyme syndrome or uh, a, a chronic infection or, or some other way that people might have chronic symptoms with or without an active infection. Um, and I think when you're dealing with this, the, our best way to answer any question is truly to look to science because scientists love nothing more than proving each other wrong and testing each other's theories. Um, so it comes down to where does somebody who's not a scientist in this realm or a physician with a certain specialty look so they can get the right direction. And we look for um, sources that we can trust for uh, unbiased guidance. Sometimes that's physicians, although not all physicians are in agreement and not all physicians are equal. Um, and I think when it comes to health information, a fantastic source is the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, the NIAIH, National Institute of uh, Allergy and Infectious Disease. And all of these organizations have statements about Lyme disease, chronic treatment, chronic Lyme disease syndromes. And um, well, I would suggest that people who are looking for more information go to those pages before they pick a physician, a doctor, who may or may not be on the right side of the evidence. But I guess this circles around to my question for you, is how somebody who doesn't know the science, who is not an expert, who is not trained in medicine or that, that infectious disease, where they can go so that they're not just picking an expert um, which is uh, relatively arbitrary. I mean, how can they have a grounded first step in finding the true science? Great question. And I guess I'll split it into two parts because I loved your response on um, trusted sources and, and um, the, you know, uh, you talk about the controversy of Lyme disease. Yes, there are uh, different directions and different opinions on treatment and prolonged treatment. Um, and no, you shouldn't just select uh, the first one you see on Google of a uh, Lyme literate doctor. I'm just going to go to this clinic and get some treatment that wasn't researched or studied. Um, but that's where organizations like us come in. So it, we we don't we don't have one side of the argument that we uh, are behind. We're not behind one treatment as opposed to the other. We have doctors and scientists on our board that are from all different. Um, uh, have different ideologies, different uh, research to back their studies up and their findings. We just had a summit um, at, at Upstate where we had a integrative medicine, a functional medicine doctor, and a um, 
just a, a regular infectious disease doctor uh, take on case studies and, and ha have their different opinions on how they would treat different cases. So uh, we're really helping to combine that conversation and take some of the controversy out of it. But I agree with you, yes, you shouldn't just jump into some treatment um, or, or do a little pick of, of a doctor to, to go and treat. I do think you need to do your research and um, look into organizations like us who can kind of hold your hand through that process, who have people like me and other people who have dealt with this issue um, on hand to, to help you find the right spot and, and the spot you're comfortable with. All right, we do have another question from the chat uh, from, uh, from Peter. It says, is there a vaccine or was there a vaccine for Lyme disease? I guess Great question. Again, um, there was a vaccine. It was called Lyme Rix. Um, it was discontinued back in the day. There was some, uh, you know, interest kind of failed in it. There was some issues with the efficacy of it. Um, I just listened to a whole uh, a talk by one of our board members on the vaccine because they are revamping the vaccine. I'm not sure what stage of the clinical trials they're in, but they're, they are doing a uh, trial here at Upstate in Syracuse. They are doing, I believe, one in Rochester with Moderna. Um, I usually, I, you know, I, I tread lightly with the topic just because I know it can be very, uh, can, can, uh, send a, a presentation in, in a different direction when it comes to talking about things, especially in this day and age. Um, but there is a vaccine in the works. There was a vaccine and unfortunately it uh, came off the market, but hopefully soon, um, we'll get one on that can, can, uh, help keep us safe during the season. So it is in the works. Um, but unfortunately the one that was, uh, already out was discontinued uh, so i got another question uh my wife uh ended up uh, with with lyme disease and and uh fortunately appears to be not uh an ongoing much like you know the like you but she certainly had uh, a, a rough time of it initially uh i guess the question here then is if you've had lyme disease can you get it again from what i understand yes and and i you can do that in a in kind of a two pronged answer because I think people with with uh, lingering symptoms of Lyme and uh, people who have tr uh, treated them often talk about relapse of Lyme disease after treatment. But I've also uh, even one of my neighbors growing up, he got Lyme disease uh, one summer and then three summers later got bit by another tick and got it again. So I do think reinfection is possible once you do get it, and especially with all the co-infections. Again, Lyme disease is a blanket term for all tick-borne illness. So you could get another uh, tick-borne illness or, or a co-infection um, from, from another tick bite. So you're not safe once you get it once. All right, got another question out of the chat. Uh, this from RetroJet uh, saying, uh, do cold winter temperatures kill them off? Or is there an, in, uh, is there an average lifespan? But they, I guess they must have plugged in earlier uh, or later to say, sorry if it's been asked. Um, no, but what fine. happens during the winter? Yeah, so uh, their their lifespan is two to three years. They don't just die off in, in a winter freeze. Um, this was brought up, but it was very early on in the slides. Um, so, and, and we have an expert, Brian Ledette, on our board who works at ESF, and is, he's the tick expert, and I take as much as I can from him and try and regurgitate it back to, to the people. Um, but he, he talks quite a bit about how they can live comfortably underneath the freeze during the winter and find different microclimates um that you know the soil from the earth can keep it warm enough for the ticks so that they can survive they don't all die off good question all right very good um i think that's all i see in the chat any other questions here locally oh another one here all right here we go i'm in uh, the woods almost every day and i uh i stack wood under under the decks in my house that i get from a another location wherever it might be uh I'm not very, I haven't, I, I've been in the woods a lot. I, I have never seen, I check myself for ticks. I haven't found a tick on me. Uh, but I wonder, are there people that, that can't get Lyme disease? And the other question would be, when, when we have mice in the wood pond and stuff, and, and you know, squirrels, you name it, all over the house, all, all over the, 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 the land. Uh, what I wonder is, uh, when, when, a, when a mouse has Lyme disease, is that the same thing that, that a deer is it is it the, the deer disease? There's a different one for the mice, and uh, yeah. we live with a lot of deer too. I, th I think I'm I'm lucky to to be able to be here today. I'm sorry to hear about your ongoing problem, but uh, just okay. 
No, no, good, good question. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm somebody who's not in the woods every day, and uh, I got stuck with this. So it's, uh, you know, when I hear people like people like you, you're definitely one of the lucky ones who. Um, but yes, there are. Uh, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm not sure if there's some people who are just immune to Lyme disease. Um, I know white-tailed deer are not affected by the disease. Um, but you know, uh, white-footed mice, small mice that you see on the are definitely very popular hosts and can carry Lyme disease. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure why you, you know, have never found You're very lucky to have never found a tick being out in the woods as, as often as you are. Um, but as far as humans who can't get it, I don't know that. Um, I don't know if there are people who are immune to the disease just, just naturally. I, I, I uh, I would hope I, you know, I, that, that'd be pretty cool. I, I should look into if there are any studies into that, but I'm not sure. All right, another question out of the chat from Ricky. Do ticks have a natural predator? Do ticks have a natural predator? Well, it, funny thing, I've had a, I've, I go to a lot of tables and markets and, and um, uh, you know, in, in different places and talk to the public and give out some information. And I know a lot of people, uh, they, they come to me and they talk about possums uh, eating ticks. And they also talk about uh, chickens eating ticks. Um, do I know their their primary predator that goes out and eats ticks? No, but I do know there are things that eat ticks. Um, so there there have been plenty of people out in rural events that I've had that said, "Oh, we get chickens, and the chickens eat all our ticks." Do I know if that's true? No, but that's what I've heard anecdotally. So I'm assuming um, there are multiple animals that feed on ticks. All right, so we need more chickens, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, everyone buy chickens. Let them loose. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. All right. Well, um, I think you've pretty much covered. Oh, looks like we got one more question here. Perfect. Hold on. Can you show um, us where the gland thingies, where it uses to sense the heat are on the tick thing you have, the giant one? <laughs> sure. Sure. And you can see up on the slide, too. So it's going to have the eight legs because it's a part of the arachnid family and it's going to be on these front legs um it's and they you can see in that questing slide I, i'm not sh sure which one it was um right here you can see they're going to hold those front legs out and i believe it's at the base of the front legs if you want to get very specific but they hold them out in the air kind of like little antennas um and and they they have a very sensitive organ on them that can help uh help them sense if a, if a warm-blooded host is coming that guy falls off he wasn't too good at, at his job but um that that's where it is so actually um you, you said they don't jump so basically you you would have to brush up against whatever it is that the tick is on and then the tick would would make that uh, transition that's a very important point you have to touch the tick they don't they don't like jump to latch onto you they don't um but you know if you're walking in a high brush area or near vegetation, they're going to stick their arms out and wait for you to brush into them. So it's very important if you are out on like a hike or you're going somewhere to stay as, as central in the path as you can in the middle of the path, because they love that outside brush right outside the trail, because that's a lot, they know a lot of humans and, and animals brush into that as they walk by. Um, so no, they don't jump after you or, or chase after you. They're not very fast little uh, creatures, but they will wait for you. And they're they're, they're technically ambush predators, but I have trouble saying that in presentations because they're so small. When I think ambush predators, I think big cats and big animals uh, that, that wait for their prey, but they are ambush predators. So uh, they wait for the host to come to them. So like, again, if I'm walking and, you know, I brush up against, uh, you know, some grasses with a tick on it, even though I have my pants on, they could latch onto the pants and then ultimately they would then look for the, the skin. Yep. Yep. They'll crawl right up the skin. They'll, you know, if your shirt wasn't tucked in, they'll crawl up there and then find uh, the skin. They, they aren't fast. They do move somewhat slow. And that's why we say as, as when you do get back to the house, as soon as you can throw them in the dryer, take a shower, because they take some time to find a good place to bite to, uh, you know, to start feeding. So you can easily brush them off if they have not uh, dug their, their mouth, their mouthpiece in yet. Um, but yeah, if they get on a piece of clothing, that's why we say cover as much skin as possible if you can when you're outside, because that does uh, limit the risk if you're limiting your skin exposure. All right, very good. All right, well, 
I really want to thank you very much. It's clear that um, you are uh, very passionate about this, and, and understandably so. And uh, uh, it's funny because my wife, you know, is also very passionate about it. And uh, um, not to say that I, you know, disregarded it, but I, um, I can really understand um, the concern that she has, and uh, and and obviously you and and everyone uh, associated with the. Uh, with, with the organization on, on educating people to make sure that uh, uh, you're aware of this situation. And, and fortunately, it's, it's uh, with some fairly easy and common sense things to do, you can uh, really reduce your risk. So, uh, absolutely. absolutely. So, yep. I really, I really yes. want to thank you uh, very much for, uh, for your time this evening. And um, uh, thank for those wa uh, who've offered questions and those uh, uh, watching on the, li on the, on the live stream. Uh, we'll be back here again next Friday. Um, Dr. Stanley Hunter, who actually is in the house <laughs> tonight, um, uh, will be actually talking about uh, some of the work that he does uh, with uh, concussions and brain injury and uh, the physics and physiology behind that. So um, uh, please uh, come to us next week. Uh, I promise to do better on, uh, on, on clearing out the clouds, and uh, uh, we'll do some observing afterwards as well. So. Uh, and, and Jacob, if, if you are in a, a position to come down here into Binghamton, we'd love to, uh, to to show you our place down here. Absolutely. Yeah, I know a lot about ticks, and I know nothing about astronomy. So I'd, I'd be happy to come and, and be educated uh, okay, then as it's, well. So. It's our turn to turn it, turn it in your direction. So, so thanks again. I, again, fair. appreciate it. I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming tonight and um, look forward to uh, having you up again soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. And quickly, Drew, yes. I'm not sure um, if we could do this, but would you mind um, shooting me either an email or, or I, I can see the, the YouTube had some people on it, but just a total attendance of who was who was here? Sure. I, I've, I'll have the um, – uh, once, just... once this finishes, I'll be able to uh, uh, look at the total attendance, and um, I, I can send you that information. Yeah, just a just a number is fine. Just sure. just for uh, record keeping purposes and Understand. stuff like that. We'll do. All right. Thank All right. you very much. You're welcome. All right.